Students say MBBS, DNB Pediatrics, DM Medical Gastroenterology. So presently is assistant professor, Department of uh, uh, Digestive Health and Disease, Kilpak Medical College, Chennai, and consultant gastroenterologist, Apollo Hospitals, main Apollo Hospitals, Green Store, Chennai. And he's a member of the Indian Society of Gastroenterology, European Society of Gastroenterology, American Society of Gastroenterology, Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy of India. He has done a lot of uh, research activities and a lot of uh, areas of interest are role of a plasma paresis in liver transplant recipient, immunosuppressant liver transplantation. His achievements are uh, endoscopic ultrasound, pancreatic endotherapy, uh, third space endoscopy, and two months of fellowship in uh, EUS. So, Sar is a wonderful uh, you know, orator and the clinician. He is our elite member of our IMH and Ibilwaka Mainabaram branch. So, with this few introduction, may I request uh, the speaker of this topic, uh, Dr. Arun Sir. Please take over and you can start sharing the stage. The stage is yours. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome Sir, for your wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you, team IMA EMS Wing for the first wonderful opportunity to provide it to me. And it's really a great honor to present this topic in front of a expert panel and also in front of a great master, Professor Dr. Palnivel, sir, the chairman of GEM Hospital. It's really a great honor for us to present in front of you, sir. And right now, I'll be taking on with the presentation, sir. And also all the participants and all the team members who have been here, I would like to extend my gratitude and also I, wish, I would like to wish everybody a fantastic new year. I think you can able to see my slides, am I right, sir? Okay, sir, you can go ahead, sir. Yeah. Can you able to see my slides, sir? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, sir. Yes, sir, you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and almost around 400 members in board right now to join in this fantastic, uh, uh, wonderful IMA initiative, which has been done for the first time uh, in 2024. And uh, to make this topic, see, post lunch session to talk on constipation, it's really a constipating issue because constipation is a chronic problem, starting from your pediatric, starting from a infant, starting from a neonatal age group to infants, to toddlers, to adolescent, to late adolescent, to adult, to elderly population, constipation will be a common etiological focus. So once a patient is going to land up with constipation, so what are you going to do? How are you going to recognize the presentation? What are you going to, how are you going to approach the scenario? And in case if you're going to diagnose the patient with constipation, how are you going to recognize in the presentation? And how are you going to manage and how are you going to counsel and how are you going to follow? That's what's the most important area. Because most of the time when a patient comes to you with evidence of constipation, as a physician, as a surgeon, as a practicing consultant, even as a gastroenterologist, we should be able to analyze whether the patient is having evidence of any alarming picture is there or not. If the patient is having alarming picture, then accordingly how to proceed with the further worker. If in case if the patient is not having alarming picture, how are you going to proceed with the further worker? So here in a brief 20 minutes of session, I would like to highlight you how are you going to analyze a patient with constipation with a brief outline. So as per the definition, there are multiple layman terminology. It could be hard stools, clean stools, some blotted evidence of your tummy and incomplete evacuation and frequent. What you worry not being bored? Hello, sir. So now, yeah, Okay. So the most important entirety as per the definition, predominantly the patient will be having excessive straining and. Around 40% of the population will be presenting to you with evidence of arm stools and inability to have a complete bowel movement. So what is the basic definition for your constipation? If you're going to look into that, there are various criteria to prove that. So what is the basic definition means in case if your bowel movements, if it is going to less than three bowel movements in a week, that's a basic definition for a constipation. And there are so many other guidelines to prove that. And row one and two initially came from 2016 onwards. Row four has taken over the guidelines for your constipation and to classify the constipation and to label the patient's functional constipation or not. Irritable bowel syndrome is coexisting, is there or not? All these pointers we need to take into account when you are planning to manage a patient with chronic constipation. And if the bowel movements, if it is going to be less than three per week, ideally the bowel movement should be at least 12 to 14 in a week. 
So if the bowel movements, if it is going to be less than three, that means the patient is having evidence of constipation. And this is what the latest guidelines been mentioned. So what they're trying to say in case, if you're applying as per the room four position statement, if you're going to see, if you are predominantly, if you're going to strain, incomplete evacuation, a lumpiness of your stool, incomplete drumming, if you're going to have a blockage of a sensational anorectal blockage and less than three evacuations, and if it is going to be there for more than three months of duration, that means the patient is going by evidence of chronic constipation. As per the definition of this room for position statement, what they're going to mention in 2016 onwards. So how to recognize this presentation? Ideally, if your patient is coming to your OP in the background of constipation, first of all, you need to see whether the patient is fitting into this one. What is the predominant etiological focus? Suppose based upon the age criteria, for example, in pediatric age group, Ashprungs is very common. If you're going to see a ribbon-like stools, you might be having Ashprung disease that might be needed an urgent surgical intervention to the baby as early as possible. And based upon the various presentation, varied age groups, you can able to identify the huge list of causes for constipation, probably a second etiological focus. If you're going to divide your constipation, 80% of the population will be having functional constipation and only 20% will be having organic source of constipation in which you can able to identify easily. It could be because of drug induced, it could be because of neurological, it could be because of uh, various of the, it could be because of inflammatory or obstructive pathology that might be involving a GA tract. There are so many reasons for the secondary that you can able to point out quickly. But for the functional constipation, in order to recognize whether the patient fits into a normal transit constipation or a slow transit constipation or dyssynergic defecation, or the patient is going for evidence of irritable bowel syndrome. Always you should remember one common entity nowadays in India because of obesity, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, multiple coexisting comorbidities, functional disorders, anxiety, depression. Depression, predominant IT population, elderly population, they'll be staying in home for a longer duration of time and work from home culture has been growing very high nowadays. So the constipation tends to be very severe nowadays. But how to recognize? Because most of the patients will be taking multiple molecules before they are going to reach the gastroenterologist. At the point of time, we need to counsel, we need to alleviate the anxiety, we need to put him on medication, we need to take care of the presentation. All of those things to be done in a proper way to make the patient to get convinced. Addressing only the GA problem doesn't mean the patient will get significant benefit. We need to control function status physically, mentally, socially, all the spheres of involvement to be taken care of when you're going to manage the patient of constipation because in the background of functional constipation issues, most of the patient will be having significant anxiety or coexisting depression most of the time when you're going to address this kind of scenario. So based upon the economic status, physical activity, your drug use, you risk of risk factors are there. Basic definition for this is normal transit time for your colon should be around minimum 40 hours in case if the transit, if it is going to prolong approximately more than 75, that means the patient is going for slow transit constipation. What is this defecated disorder I'll be taking on with your secondary constipation and IBS as I discussed. If you're going to look into irritable bowel syndrome, three things you should remember, abdominal pain, abdominal bloat, and the change in frequency or change in consistency of your stool pattern, which is persisting at least for three months of duration for a a uh, period of almost around six months. So this is what the basic definition. It could be because of diarrhea, or it could be because of constipation, or it could be because of mixed time. That's a bit separate entity to be taken, taken care of. And my area of intention to be discussed predominantly to constipation. Basic definition about normal transit constipation. Simply remember this few, few points. See, this will be the most common type. And the stool is going to pass from your colon at a normal rate, but the stool frequency is often within the normal range, but patient will always find difficulty to evacuate their bowel. So always this will be overlapped with your high BS type C. What is a slow transit? They may not have the urge to pass. So usually they may not have the urge to defecate. So decrease urgency, but you can able to palpate the stool in the colon and you can able to identify significant bloating. 
So always rectum is a, a significant driver you know, for your stool to get load and the physiology of defecation, your puberectal is contraction, your sphincter opening, all those things to be initiated properly. Then only the defecation process can be augmented in a normal way. So once a dysfunction, if it is going to set on in your smooth muscle, neurotransmitters, your pacemaker, like ICC activity, interstitial cells, or cardial, all those things will be locating. And these things, if there is any dysfunction, your true slow transit will be there. That's predominantly of theoretical purpose. But as a practitioner, as a physician, you should remember how to recognize the patient, how do you going to refer, when you're going to intervene, how do you going to manage. What is this defecated disorder? So always they'll be spending the time in the toilet and they'll be having frequent digital evacuation. That one thing you should always be very cautious. When you're planning for frequent digital evacuation, you need to counsel the patient not to do like that. And moreover, most of the time, the patient may have any ulcer. That's what is called a solitary rectal ulcer and other coexisting present patient may develop. And for to this kind of patient, defecated disorders, there are so much of battery of investigations that to diagnose, but laxatives will not be having a significant beneficial role to this kind of patients rather than we need to go for a biofeedback augmentation therapy to this kind of patient. Many patients had the disorder since childhood due to impaired learning defecation. So what is this basics? So defecatory disorder is the anal relaxation, two major mechanics. If your anal relaxation, if it is going to get impact and paradoxical external and sphincter as a pubic the child is if it is going to get contract. And as you all know, there are multiple associations with organic pathology, like your rectocele, your solid rectal ulcer, and usually the coexisting presentation of your slow transit constipation and your rectal hyposensitivity syndromes will be a common pathology when you're going to land up with these defecated disorders. If you want to diagnose this defecated disorder, three tests you should remember. Balloon expulsion and anorectal manometry, EMG, or imaging, any colon transit study, if you're going to plan for. So these are all the basic tests. I'll be talking on that briefly when I'm going to take on with my slides in the upcoming areas. See, this is what the basic physiology you should understand. So what is going to happen? Normally, once the stools, if it is going to get load in your rectum, what is going to happen? There will be the sensory perception will be there. The rectum is going to get distant and your diaphragm is going to get contract, which is going to relax your sphincter, external sphincter, and it is going to relax your pubic rectum. So what is going to happen? The prolonged colon exchange is what is going to happen, the discoordination. In case of this signage, yeah, the rectal hyposensitivity is going to be there. The paradoxical increase of your pressures will be there. So what is going to happen? The sphincter relaxation will not be adequate. So the inadequate proportion is going to be there for a patient who's going to land up with evidence of dyssynergy. Secondary causes, right from basics, very huge list of causes, medication, antidepressants and antihepatensis and analgesics always, anti Parkinsonian molecules. Secondary causes, metabolic focus, like your thyroid, your diabetic, your parathyroid, along with your electrolyte disturbances, like your hypokalemic as well as magnesium abnormalities and extensive neurological damage because of your immobilization. And there are huge lists of secondary focus of causes, for example, bank, bank, and Parkinsonism, the paraneoplasty, and your diet activities. So diet, if it is low in fiber, so mainly you need to target a fiber intake of at least 20 to 30 grams per day, but how far it's difficult. Some patients may have osmotic events further, but ideally initially to target with five grams, slowly stepping up of fiber because too much of fiber intake, you need to make a fiber diet, that should be a separate area, at least soluble fiber intake, at least in the range of 20 to 30 grams per day, that will be the predominant area to discuss. And recognizing, so how are you going to recognize Take a proper clinical history. Put a proper stool diary. Look for the red flag signs. Red flag signs, what are the red flag signs? If there is any bleeding, always it will be abnormal. If the patient is having significant weight loss, it might be because of functional severe depression or it might be alarming. So you need to be very cautious. If the patient is having new onset of constipation more than 30 years, if you're going to feel a mass in the tummy, in case if the patient is anemic, iron deficiency, if your patient is going to present with chenismus, Tennis with nothing but a abnormal sensation if it is going to happen in your rectum. Any obstructive symptoms if it is going to be there, you need to be very, very cautious. So, history taking is very, very important. What is the frequency of stooling? 
whether he's training or not, whether the person is using and or not, digital evacuation is there or not, what is the consistency of stools? If you're going to look into the Vista chart, the first one, two, three will be predominantly for constipation. As the 10 progress, it will be predominantly for and six and seven, I'll be showing you in the chart. And where's the patient they have, I mean, going for any digital manuals or any postural change? They may be adopting this posture, that posture, various postural changes might be there. Whether the patient is using laxity, whether the patient is responding to the laxity, is any secondary possible etiology? Are we are working up for that? That is what is important. This first three in Indian Western scenario, what they've been mentioning as first two in Indian scenario, they've been mentioning as first three can be taken as evidence of constipation scenario as per Bristol stool chart, which have been used for the past two decades. And almost this six and seven, which is along Moshi, will be concentrated predominantly in the direct focus for your IBS type D like presentation. So clinical approach, as I discussed, older population, any mass, persistent fever, bloody stools, change in caliber, prolapse, bleeding, vomit, deficiency, anemia, nutritional anemic focus, all those things you need to be cautious. And history taking, as I told you, you need to be very, very careful when you're looking into the history. That's what the most important thing. And apart from diet history, whether what's the diet pattern they are going to take, whether the fiber content is okay, whether the patient's consuming adequate quantity of water, whether the patient's alcohol, like smoker, coexisting, comorbidities, thyroid, diabetes, and hypertension, all those things you need to address along with your drug and neurologic status. And one simple investigation is a digital rectal in examination. That is what is one symptom and one sign. One sign is prolonged defecation, and one symptom will be your digital rectal examination to identify your constipation. Looks to be very simple, but the RE, how do you going to do first? You the examine, inspect, then you're going to palpate, you're going to do the detailed circular motion, 360 degree of rotation, all those things followed by you need to look for signs of bleed, any obstruction, any mass, any other events, or whatever the presentation you can able to identify at least around 60 percent of the population where there's evidence of organic causes of constipation with your digital examination alone based upon the various society and one society would like to call this AJG American uh, Journal of Gastro in which you can able to identify very promptly where this uh, rectal examination very gentle and make sure you need to do <laughs> as a discus, less than one and verge uh, less than one centimeter greater than four centimeters to stimulate straining or defecation and this is what you need to look into that and palpation gently you need to be very cautious to look for the numbing picture and apart from that So with this, we can be able to identify whether the patient is having evidence of dyssynagia or unfortunately, digital rectal examination not being performed very well by most of the physicians. That's what we have been missing when we are doing. So directly subjecting the patient for endoscopic examination, colonoscopic examination would not be suffice. Well, clinically, it's clinical examination masterly is very important apart from that, along with the coexisting uh, other investigation modalities to di diagnose. And always ask the patient for stool diary, what is the mode of training, whether the patient has a discuss in the initial phase, so the stool diary, seven days stool pad, and everything has to be analyzed, and breast chart has to be done in a proper way to identify the etiological trigger. And this case scenario, briefly, a 34-year-old woman who constipating for the past three years, no major significant events, but she has tried multiple medications no major response. So what is going to happen? What are you going to label this kind of patient? First, we need to classify the disease and then we need to map out the investigations. What's the investigations? So first, we need to see whether the alarming features is there or not. And in case, if it is a slow transit constipation, there are you list of investigation protocol and this signage are the list of investigations protocol are there. For example, slow transit, we can able to identify the colonic transit study. There are so many markers for that. I will be telling you briefly. And colonoscopy, see, investigations protocol for constipation is really a toughest chance for us to understand. But you need to remember the basic concepts to whom you're going to refer for that. How are you going to recognize the presentation? That's what is very important before I'm going to wind up this session. And pelvic floor dyssynergy, if the patient is having anorectal manometry, your defecography, for example, your barium defecogram, as well as your MR defecography, definitely and the more high sensitivity as the specificity, you can do all those things to diagnose. For irritable bowel syndrome, functional constipation, I mean, uh, type C presentation, usually there is no major investigation modality by clinical perspective, and all those things you can able to identify rolling out the alarming pictures. 
Apart from that, always you need to look for the systemic focus like your inflammatory, neoplastic, or metabolic, or any other coexisting systemic illness like the neurological parameters. Apart from that, structural disease, we need to always do imaging of CT, MRI, small bowel imaging, if needed, from an endoscopic analysis, and endoscopy in that case, if the patient deserves. And main thing, there are three major important morality as per the American neurogastroenterology mortality study, what we mentioned is, one is radio opaque marker, and what are you going to measure the slow colonic transit to label the patient's throat, slow transit or dyssynergic defecation is there or not. So radio opaque marker test, one is wireless mortality capsule, and another one is your scintigraphy. What is this radio opaque marker? So, Main thing you ask the patient, so mainly if you're going to do, in case if you're going to take a serial image, you're going to take a capsule which contains almost 24 markers. So what I want you to see, in case if you're going to return more than 20 markers over a period of around more than 20, 120 hours, that means the patient tends to have a abnormal event in your, uh, I mean, uh, in your marker study. Apart from that, next to that, your mortality capsule, what you're going to see, you're going to measure your bowel transit, you're going to measure the pressures, you're going to measure the anorectal reflexes, all those things by a wireless and pH uh, capsule, what you're going to place at a distance of around five feet from the patient in which you can able to measure, that's what through a transmitter is going to transmit. And this is what the brief outline, as I discussed, the normal colonic transit and all that transit, you should remember that apart from these all the basic things. And what is the scintigraphy? So this is nothing but the radial label marker. Once you're going to take this radial label marker, you need to see the colonic transit time. If it is going to be, if it is going to be less than 1.7, it is considered as a slow transit constipation. That's what the main indication for me to take on. And there are various tests to assess the physiology of defecation, like your defecography, your ENG, and your balloon expulsion. Balloon expulsion tends to be very, very simple that I would like to point out here. So defecography, what, what's the main role in case if you're going to identify your rectocele or any other abnormal, that's a mucosal prolapse or intersusception, at the point of juncture, uh, you might be missing out the organic pathology. So MR defecogram can able to picking up the diagnosis very well rather than radio, which tends to have more radiation induced injuries. So MR defecogram could be a cons could be considered when you are going to look in for defecogram in the, uh, this synergic defecation. And apart from that, uh, so these are all the various things you can identify, sigma diametrical and all those things. So radiation definitely is going to have a significant impact. When you are going to use MR, the radiation injury will be definitely less. Anorectal manometry is a very, very important because, so what is the main role if the anorectal man, if the rectoanal inhibition reflex is going to be absent, that means the patient is having evidence of Eschprung. Eschprung doesn't mean the patient will be predominantly pediatric age group. It may be in elderly population too. So you need to be very cautious to recognize the presentation. Anorectal manometry, to be yeah, going to identify the various pressures to be able to identify whether the patient is having evidence of this is there or not. And as I discussed, these are all the various pointers to identify your dyssynergic defecation type 1, 2, 3, 4, based upon your push effort from your uh, sphincter muscles in which is going to get augmented. You're going to be able to elicit the contraction and relaxation phases. Uh, you can able to see through this graph what we are going to represent. Balloon expulsion test is very simple. Inflate a 50 ml balloon, make the patient left lateral position, just inject and make sure that the patient is supposed to expel the balloon within one minute. If you're not going to do that, which means the patient is going for evidence of dyssynergia, the patient is going to have worsening of even. So you need to be very conscious with this test. Very simple test, but you need to be conscious when you're going to do this one. Okay. And next to that, this is what the basic approach. So, so for you to diagnose with your Clinical, uh, um, you know, picture what you're going to analyze for your uh, constipation, slow transit, functional, and other thing. But endosonogram also can be considered in your diagnosis of any obstructive pathology in case if the patients have any sub epithelial lesions at that point of time, the rectal involvement, it is that you can use the endosonogram also. There are a huge list of in investigations protocol due to constraints of time and not going to brush into the, all those etiology. This is another case scenario in which 
a female patient who went tried with land searches, but there are no relief and ends refer for the further management. This is all we need to analyze. So history taking, behavioral therapy, what is this biofeedback? That's one more interesting entity that I'll be discussing with you all. So basically, clinically, you need to recognize metabolic focus and other things and basic drug management if you want you can try and if the patient doesn't show respond manometry and balloon expulsion we can think in terms of transit slow transit or normal transit or diffugram if you want you can do and followed by you can be able to identify whether the patient is having a discharge is there or not this is all the outline so basically to consider the management recognize the alarming picture do the basic work of your colonoscopy and upper GI in case if it's upper absolutely indicated and see whether the patient is having dyssynergy of your manometry. But stop the patient counseling, diet, your fiber, as well as your alcoholic, smoking, all the major triggers to be eliminated along with patient education, toilet training, and morning and night, the patient's supposed to go to toilet at least five minutes a day, even if, even if there is no active bowel movements, 30 minutes post meal, you need to encourage the patient to go for frequent toilet training and eliminate the precipitating factor. Look for a secondary etiological trigger, secondary causes like neuro and other events, we might add another causes and start the patient on good fiber supplement, increase the dose and use list of laxatives, your bulk laxatives, your osmotic laxatives, so many use list of molecules are there, but before, you're going to start slowly you stepping up and stepping down regimen. And once it's not going to work up, you can go for a new list of prokinetics. And finally, nothing work, you can go for a surgical intervention, which most of the time doesn't deserve for a patient with chronic constipation and functional constipation events. So as I discussed, we need to increase the management part is very important. First, the diet, as well as Utilize the gastrocolonic reflex as I told you. Always ask the patient to defecate twice a day and new list of molecules are the newer trends in the management of constipation. New, new molecules being tried that I'll be discussing briefly with you all. And outlet, to discuss about the outline of the various laxatives, as you all know, the bulk laxatives, your stool softeners, your stimulant laxatives, the osmotic laxatives. So what are the laxatives you're going to use? Always look for three major things. If the patient is volume overloaded, be very cautious. If the patient is having cardiac events, be very cautious. If the patient is having renal injury, be very cautious. And moreover, when you're going to use polyethylene glycol, whether you're going to use a disimpaction dose or the maintenance dose, you need to be very, very cautious. That those are all the things we got. And, more, and next to that, whether the patient is having any evidence of obstructive pathology, it might be pseudo obstruction, it might be a partial obstruction. So you need to be very, very conscious when you're going to use that might be precipitate your worsening of obstruction. So your laxatives you're choosing, you need to be very, very cautious. If the patient is going to have a dyssynergy, your laxatives most of the time is not going to work. So be cautious in choosing the patient, just like that, writing the prescription all with your peg and all the supports will not going to help you much. As you know that the commonly using will be your besacoril as well as when you're going to think of Aspergilla and all those things when you're going to think the commonly available is lactulose and next to that, if it is not working, we can go for PET. If it is not working, we can try a course of Senna or besacoril. Besacoril, the patient five to 10 milligrams can be tried. But even after that, if it's not working, your prokinetic molecules can be tried. So these are all the various new prokinetics in the market. You should remember, but as of now, nothing much. Yeah. Lubiprostone is well available, but linaclotide and plecanotide, these are all the colonic secretives. So what is the role of constipation management? We need to increase the water absorption, absorptive capacity in the colon. The water retention should be more in the colon. So enhance the fluid load in the colon. Then what is going to happen? The colon motility is going to get improved. The transit is going to come down. That's what the most important thing for you to tackle with evidence of this colonic secret of gods like your lubiprostone, linaclotide, or placanatide, you list of molecules are there. So basically, we need to activate our chloride channels, which is the main event which is going to involve in the CFTR, nothing but cystic fibrosis, transmembrane regulator pathway. So basic things you should not forget, once you're going to get your activation of your chloride channels, what's going to happen? The patient is going to read in the water, the colonic motility is going to get improved, the stools is going to get disimpact. That's a major, major mechanism for most of the molecules to get taken on. Your libiprostone is being well available as you're going to consider the rate of 24 mics, lelactotide, your granulocyclase activators, you can go in, so you can consider. And these are all the plaquenetide 
that it does. But briefly, briefly, we would like to point out this. Now, some of the secondary molecules, like, for example, if you're going to take opioids, at that point of time, you're going to develop a constipation. Then these molecules, it's what's called femora. What is femora? Periphery acting mu opioid receptor antagonist. So these are all the various list of femoras. Your methyl naltrexone, your adenosine, as well as your non axigol There are really lists. You should remember certain basic things. These are all the specific causes. And secondary causes is something different. The specific causes is something different. How are you going to tackle a patient? Pregnant women, all these things you need to be very conscious when you're going to use uh, your laxatives at that point of scenario. And basic things nowadays, even most of the physicians will be using your procalibrate, start with one milligram, two milligram, and even up to four milligram. There's nothing but your 5-HT4 agonists. What's going to happen? As you know, that is up, right? Degasaride. Now, new molecules like Velus, drug, nanonopride, so many molecules that leave it out. Basically, you need to remember that we can use this for chronic idiopathic constipation and IBS type C leg presentation. And be very cautious when you're going to use any procalibrate. Most of the patient will be having IBS mixer. The patient may have IBS diarrhea, the patient may have IBS constipation. So when you're going to subject with this kind of molecule, the patient may have worsening of symptom. So assessing the patient as a whole is very important when you're going to manage this kind of scenarios and pregnancy, breastfeeding, no much of beneficial role, always better to avoid at that point of juncture, this uh, 5H2 4 receptor agonist molecule, which is going to predominantly act on your TAM, as well as your chloride channel agonist and all those things. And this biofeedback, what are you going to do? Very few centers in India are being, doing this successfully, but many centers are trying, but how far they are being successful. Because over there, go share from SGBJ published that. So, and the way I would like to point out this is instrument based training, your probe, your operant conditioning effort has to be attacked, and all those things. What is this? The device is going to place in your rectum, the diaphragmatic, diaphragmatic muscle training, and training, all those things, but. It's a cumbersome procedure, how far you're going to do, and how far you're going to be successful and difficult. It's still a questionable issues. And surgical options, no much of beneficial role. Your colectomy and sacral nerve stimulation, still a questionable thing. Apart from that, this is all outline of your various molecules, and you're going to consider. And some reason updates, one of the things mainly the fecal microbiota transplant that I would like to point it over. So fecal microbiota transplantation in which the patient's own feces, if they're going to inject, ingest through the right tube into the patient's gut, at that point of time, either through the rectal root or the oral root, if you're going to ingest to the patient's gut, so you are going to cultivate a new microbiota. That's the area. Now the gut microbiota is very common condition scenario in which it's been taken on the entire area, not only for gastroenterology, even for hepatology your alcoholic hepatitis, for example, your uh, liver failure, for example, even respiratory condition, non-respiratory, neurological focus, the gut microbiota has taken a predominant role. And role of probiotic, I don't know much of slides, probiotics always can be considered when you're going to manage a patient with irritable bowel syndrome, constipation predominant, briefly outlining. The FMT can be tried, but no much of beneficial role. Still, we need more and more papers to validate it. So before concluding, what I would like to point out is Assessing the patient as a whole, take a proper clinical history, look for the alarming signs, and do minimal investigations, counsel the patient on diet, lifestyle modification, and see whether the patient fitting into the criteria of IBS, C, or in the background of functional constipation, or in the background of uh, secondary causes of constipation, that might be uh, that might be the precipitating, that might be the clue. You need to look into that. Apart from if you're going to be able to identify mapping out with minimal investigation and putting the patient on best of molecules, serial follow, and this is what, and look for coexisting complications, look for any worsening of events. And these are all the areas you need to be very conscious when you're going to tackle a patient with this chronic idiopathic constipation. With this, I'm happy to rest my presentation. Thank you all for patient listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Arun, for this uh, wonderful presentation on uh, chronic constipation. So the medical history examinations and the proper uh, examination using the interventions like endoscopy, colonoscopy, so when to do, and the surgical indications, and a lot of uh, medical treatment available for the chronic constipation. So wonderfully, you had a presentation. So we had uh, one question, two, three questions in the chat box. The first question from Dr. Sundar Muthi, sir, asking, 
whether drugs like uh, domperidone and the uh, PPI, protomum inhibitor for uh, asymptomatic disease, whether these can cause any constipation like uh, the omeprazole combination or pantoprazole combination along with the domperidone, whether it yes. can cause any constipation. See, domperidone is a prokinetic. The role of constipation is definitely not much of role because domperidone is a prokinetic. The possibility of worsening your diarrhea levels should be very higher. But when you're going to consider a PPI, there are much molecules for the patient can go for IBS type of mixer presentation. That is why the PPI, you need to be very, very cautious, even though it's having a potential beneficial role. So PPI, when you're going to use, some patient may have worsening of diarrhea, some patient may have worsening of constipation, and these are all the areas you need to be cautious. But when you're going to use a prokinetic, ideally, the most common adverse event will be because of your diarrhea. No question related with the diet and exercise any role of diet and exercise in the constipation so diet and uh, constipation and exercise and constipation diet and exercise is definitely having a significant beneficial role but the diet in what way you are going to take on that's very very important so the elimination of gluten in your diet significantly have a beneficial role in your constipation next to that gluten in the sense not only wheat, it could be because of oats, it could be because of rye. There are so many components of this gluten. So you need to be very cautious when you're going to use some patient may have been worsening. So elimination of uh -huh. gluten, that might be a clue. You can consider when you're going to manage, but how far is going to be successful alone when you're going to consider it's definitely no. Based upon the age criteria, other presentation, all those things we need to accept. And your exercise, definitely your bowel training exercise, your various postural adaptation exercise definitely is going to have a potential benefit for you to have a proper, as well as what they're mentioning. That's why Indian toileting methodology is one of the major exercises. That's why you are going to uh, use a squatting position in which you are going to open your pubic rectalis adequately, the 90 degree angle, if you're going to maintain that all, rather than going for Western commode method, if you're going to use this one at the point of junction, patient's constipation symptoms definitely is going to recognize very well. Any other question? Any other question? In the case, please uh, unmute your mic and ask the questions or type in the chat box. I'll ask the question to our uh, speaker or moderator. If there are no questions, thank you very much, Sharun, for this uh, wonderful crisp and clarity presentation on chronic constipation. Sir, sir, uh, uh, please, sir, may I request uh, moderator, sir, please. Uh, no, uh, uh, please do the closing remarks or even your opinion. Please add your opinion, sir. Opinion and what do we need to talk about? Hello, Jaira. Hi, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it is, he has covered completely medical aspect and all, uh, everything. I think nothing to comment except the surgery wise, he made it. And the only thing we have to know about. Redundancy of the sigmoid colon if it is a constipation reason and the sigmoid activity is one of the days, particularly in the old age group. And uh, otherwise, there is so called a pseudo obstruction uh, of the bowel. And there, the sicastry, what you mentioned, that you know, it can be go. That is acute emergent situation, it is temporarily. Otherwise, uh, only diet, exercise, controlling, everything is. And the colectomy very rarely and it comes only, particularly, there are two types of constipation, is you know, Constipation induced with sigma prolapse and otherwise these also. So correction of prolapse more important you want to avoid the constipation. Your redundancy is there, sigma resection, is there. these two procedures can be part of this. Again, prolapse, you do it and put a mesh and the circumstances that induces constipation. Surgery related uh, induced constipation also problem. Now we are modifying the technique in such a way that constipation is almost rare. And uh, we know how to get it done. That way, I think uh, he Arun has covered completely. Thank you very much. I appreciate Arun. Very nice. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Sir, in your experience, you, how many cases yeah. of uh, cholerotic malignancy associated with uh, chronic constipation, sir? There is a percentage wise in your experience, sir. Palimir, sir. Constipation and uh, cholerotic malignancy. Uh, cholerotic malignancy now, incidence is going up more like a Western countries. Those days, it was not much. And now we see more of colon rectal carcinoma, not only in India and in whole Asia is increasing because we are all changing towards westernized diet. And that is one reason that's why uh, one should not ignore thinking it's something else and uh, without investigation. Now, of course, they continue with the screening for malignancy. In India, still that guideline is not there. 
we don't have protocol to do it but still our, now india is so cheap and the sigmoidoscopy or uh, investigation compared to west almost small peanut but if you properly educate the people they will come periodically check them then early you can do and the, some of the people having a polyps and uh, that can turn into malignancy later so polypectomy can be also do as a preventive measures that all feasible everything can be done well and otherwise constipation pediatric age group is more common because it's from when adult that is also very rare we don't see much and uh, of course there is a habitual constipation is one more is there that's why the diet more preventive aspect surgery is very rarely been done and the, now we have a deep echography we do a t testing and we find out how holding energy whatever he talked about reflux that you can assess accordingly we can treat the patient and make it up and the uk and other countries this is a, a separate clinic they run for constipation no that is it is we need also in india you have to promote it more i think this uh, can go ahead jaram can go ahead at the other time thank you very much for that thank you very much sir for the wonderful uh, answers from live one sir modification the uh, lifestyle modifications you are advising to our uh, uh, doctors friends lifestyle modification is very difficult nowadays because we want to change it and we didn't understand our own diet pattern which is the worth to do it no that's why whatever comment on may modi the way he made the international year of millet that has promoted more among the indian people that is very important that is say one second is a habit we keep a vegetable side dish and that is very wrong concept rice has to be kept as side dish and fiber diet has to be brought into the center of the plate that make it up so every time morning afternoon night and they should have a more protein and vegetables fiber then the constipation almost will be reduced significantly and uh, that that is why it is a training otherwise uh, nothing a uh, lifestyle and uh, people uh, school education itself it teach them it is a fine go ahead yeah thank you very much yeah. Yeah. Sir, yeah. one question from the uh, IMAMS chairman, sir. What is the genetic test for <coughs> family members of the patients with colon cancer, sir? Mm, that, is, that is screening only. We have to do mycosal biopsy for DNA. A particular familial polypus is colon. Mm -hmm. You all know that hundreds of polyps will be there in that. If one of the parents identified, then the whole of the family children has to undergo colonoscopy, find out. and uh, one is a polyp also tested in between the polyp also we have to see the mucosa that will be turned into later stage that is where it is and dysplasia is there we have to dysplasia has to be treated high grade or low grade like you know screening has to be done and more so ulcerative colitis and uh, crohn's disease uh, increasing nowadays ulcerative colitis is a can cancer inducing so screening we have to keep in mind doing it early stages treatment with medicine controls it Pseudo polyps develops. That means that is the stage we have to operate and treat the patients. And um, pseudo polyps and ulcerative pan colitis, the entire colon, and this uh, stage, you know, high grade dysplasia, we have to go for total colectomy. And if we do total colectomy, we can do ileal pouch anastomosis, making it a normal stools. So that is all technically advancement has become now, and we're doing it. And the hereditary asset is a percentage wise too small. but polyposis is one thing if i can take it away straight away that all family has to be screened and one of the parents have got a colon and chances more but not all people no that can be screened and identified who is whether prone or not accordingly there are many syndromes has been described and familially or genetically it can possible that is a small percentage sir biological marker is there ka thank you yes yes it can be done yeah and now the most common problem is compared to hereditary is ulcerative colitis inflammation you know, that ibd is the one thing we should keep in mind always to go through that is very important so jeraman sir i think you can yeah thank you sir very wonderful uh, answers for the common topic uh, chronic constipation thank you palamil sir and thank you arun sir for this wonderful uh, input on this topic so thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Palneel, sir, to chair this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving to the next topic, may I request Dr. Arun, sir?